Welcome to the Broadway.com show, filmed in the historic Brill Building. I'm Imogen Lloyd Webber. And I'm Beth Stevens. Today, we're getting geared up for the new Broadway musical, The Band's Visit, the off-Broadway reboot of Torch Song, a tour of Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, and a sweet photo shoot with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And later, we're sitting down with His Majesty, Hamilton's newest King George, Ewan Morton. But first, let's get started with the news. What's the buzz, Imogen? It's always been a case of love to love you baby for us with this trio. Tony Wynne Lachance, Ariana DeBose and Storm Lever will be the three actresses playing the undisputed Queen of Disco in Summer, the Donna Summer Musical. Directed and choreographed by Jersey Boys Dream Team, Des Makinoff and Sergio Trujillo, respectively, the production will feature a book by Coleman Domingo, Robert Carey and Makinoff. Lachance will appear as Diva Donna, with DeBose as Disco Donna and Lever as Duckling Donna. Told through the dramatic lens of her final concert, the show will present the complexities and conflicts the famed songwriter and singer faced in her meteoric rise and descent. Summer, the Donna Summer Musical, is set to make its world premiere at San Diego's La Jolla Playhouse, playing on November the 7th through December the 17th. Hot stuff. I love how you said Duckling Donna, like we all know what that is. Don't we? Maybe? Donna Summer isn't the only Grammy-winning diva getting a bio musical. Tina, the Tina Turner musical, will receive its world premiere production in London this spring. Directed by Tony nominee Philida Lloyd and featuring a book by Olivia Award winner Katori Hall, Tina will play the West End's Aldrich Theatre beginning on March 21st and open on April 17th, 2018. The show follows the life of Anna Mae Bullock from Nutbush, Tennessee, who rose to fame in the 1960s with her husband Ike, suffered abuse at his hands, and went on to become a chart-topping performer of her own accord. No official word on casting, but Tony nominee Adrian Warren led the workshop for the show. You only have a few more months to catch two Broadway legends coming face to face on the stage. Warpaint, starring two-time Tony winners Patti Lapone and Christine Ebersol, has announced its final performance will be on December 30th at the Nederlander Theatre. The musical, which features a score by Scott Frankel and Michael Corey, a book by Doug Wright and direction by Michael Greif, follows the rivalry between cosmetics trailblazers Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein. It's the most beautiful battle on the Great White Way, and it will be missed. It's amazing how those ladies fight it out without messing up their makeup or hair out of place. It's a clash of the titans, not a wrestling match. There are some new stars in big shows hitting the road. Alison Walsh, who recently departed Broadway's Anastasia, is set to lead the national tour of An American in Paris as Lise de Saint. Broadway alum Matthew Scott is also joining the tour as Adam Hochberg. Catch the new stars when they join the show on October 17th in Albuquerque. Meanwhile, Mary Kate Morrissey is heading to Wicked's Emerald City as the tour's new Elphaba. After serving as a standby last year, Morrissey rejoins the blockbuster musical on September 26th when the tour's in Cincinnati. Look for her to defy gravity in a city near you. Something has been going right for the play that goes wrong. The Broadway.com Audience Choice Award winner has become the longest running play currently on the Great White Way. On September the 19th, the original Olivier Award winning West End Company was replaced by a new cast of comedic talents, including Akron Watson as Trevor, Mark Evans as Chris, Ashley Bryant as Annie, Clifton Duncan as Robert, Alex Mandel as Max, and Harrison Unger as Dennis. Current Broadway cast members Jonathan Fielding and Amelia McLean have assumed the roles of Jonathan and Sandra, respectively. The show, which follows a bunch of accent-prone thespians putting on a 1920s murder mystery, has been officially making audiences at the Lyceum Theatre cry with laughter since April the 2nd. Some sad news for Mr. Snow. Betsy Wolfe has departed the upcoming Broadway revival of Carousel due to scheduling conflicts. Wolfe, who is currently headlining Waitress and a recent Broadway.com vlogger, was announced to play the role of Carrie Pippridge in the production. Directed by Jack O'Brien, Carousel stars Jesse Mueller as Julie Jordan, Joshua Henry as Billy Bigelow, and Renee Fleming as Nettie Fowler. Previews start February 28, 2018 at the Imperial Theater with opening night set for April 12th. After the break, we chat with the stars of Band's Visit, Torch Song, and more. Now on Broadway.com, watch Wicked star Amanda Jane Cooper kick off a new season of Character Study. Go ahead, throw your rocks at me. Baking a pie is easy, if you know how. I'm still standing. If only life were as easy as pie. Waitress is a hit, raised the New York Times, with songs by Grammy-nominated artist Sarah Bareilles, an uplifting celebration of love and laughter. Sugar butter flower. Hey, I'm Jen Colella, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Welcome back. 
David Yazbek and Itamar Moses' The Band's Visit is already one of the most anticipated Broadway musicals of the season, and its top-tier cast, led by Tony Shalhoub and Katrina Lenk, will soon bring the show to life beginning October 7th at the Ethel Barrymore Theatre. We recently attended a press event at the Strand's Rare Book Room to speak with the cast and creators all about this special musical. So the band's visit is based on an Israeli movie from about 10 years ago uh, in which a group of Egyptian police orchestra musicians go to Israel to perform a concert, but because there's a miscommunication, they end up in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, and so they're stranded, and the story is just about the local Israeli townspeople taking in these Arab musicians who are stranded there, and all of the little connections that sort of do or don't form between everyone over the course of one night. First of all, I'm excited because I've never really done a musical, so it's a little bit of a challenge. It's it's a little bit of a nail biter for me, but beyond that, I think it's an important piece for the times we're in now. There's never been a musical, uh, as far as I know, about Arabic music and about Arabic people and Middle Eastern people. And it's so beautiful that there's kind of this musical celebrating our culture that's not about politics, that's not about anything that's usually talked about. It's just about people meeting and learning more about each other. I'm excited that, that Middle Eastern people, Middle Eastern kids in particular, are going to have the opportunity to come and see themselves represented as people. The musical score by three-time Tony-nominated composer David Yazbek crosses cultural genres and styles, and Yazbek fuses his rock, theater, and Middle Eastern backgrounds to create a truly fresh and unexpected composition. It's beautiful. It uses uh, influences from the Middle East in the music and also, uh, I want to say, old-school jazz sort of flavor. This was very much from the heart out. I steeped myself in Arabic music, which I've been a fan of since I was a kid. Um, and then I just got into the characters and uh, fell in love with each character and, and wrote for them. His craft, as far as a musical theater writer, is perfect, but what he adds on top of that is worldliness. That's what a lot of composers don't have. Asked to describe what has made the band's visit an already critically acclaimed and award-winning musical that leaves audiences deeply touched, the cast and creators take their best shot at pinpointing the musical's magic. It's about human connection at a fundamental level. Uh, and I think it's done in a very poetic way that reaches people. It is a story that observes traffic sin and kind of explores some of the ideas of loneliness and isolation in ways that are not bleak. <laughs> I think it's because of Tony. Because of Katrina. It's because of Katrina. Harvey Firestein's landmark play Torch Song trilogy is back renamed Torch Song. The Tony-winning piece about family, love, and being a drag performer in the 70s stars Michael Urie and Mercedes Rule at Off-Broadway's second stage. We headed to the rehearsal room to talk to Firestein, director Moises Kaufman, and the cast about the new production. It's a play about uh, um, a young man coming to age. Uh, he's a, he um, is someone who has a belief in what kind of a life he has, what kind of a life he wants it to be. Um, he has to make what he has into what he wants it to be, and that's a lot of hard work for anybody. I'm shocked at what a prophet Harvey Firestein was, that he knew in 1980 where we were going, where we were headed um, with marriage and uh, families, gay families, that he knew that. And that at the time, he was thought to be so radical to feel that way. Uh, has been very eye-opening. It's a story of a man who decides what kind of life he wants to have and then proceeds to go out and get it and make it for himself. It's a love story. It's kind of a tragedy. Uh, it, it's a drama, but it has the comedy that, that only Harvey can bring to something like that. I mean, the guy, every time he walks into a room, the entire room lights up. Everyone's so comfortable around him. He has all the answers, but he lets you find them yourself. Harvey's a man with, with more love to give than one could possibly receive. And uh, you feel that every time he's with you. Torch Song centers on the character of Arnold Beckoff, a diehard romantic who is a torch singer and a drag queen. The character is both of his time and way ahead of it. Arnold, my character, is a drag queen. A drag queen in 1975. Not a 2017 RuPaul drag queen. This is 1975. That kind of expression was uh, dangerous. Anytime a human being 
um, steps out of what is expected and what is traditional and steps into something that is new, that is daring, and that reflects his own or her own experience in a way that, that, that cuts new ground, is timely anytime. I think why it's timeless, what will feel timeless about it is the cyclical nature of hate and that here we are once again back in a society that has a lot of hate. The sad part is when I say, oh my God, we're still fighting that war, you know, 30 something years later, we're still, and I guess that is still true. I wish it was more of a period piece, but I guess it's not. I guess we are still fighting the same wars. The Tony winning tuner, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, which follows a young, unacknowledged heir to a huge fortune who embarks on a killing spree to remove the eight relatives who stand between him and his prize, will soon begin its third year of touring across North America. We recently spoke with the new stars of the tour, who gave us a preview of the wild and witty musical. What I love about this show is that not only is it genius writing from the brilliant creative team of Robert Friedman and Stephen Ludvack, uh, but it's also just an actor's dream to get into the world of this Edwardian period with so much comedy and style and just a great time. The show is so well written. Um, it's uh, it's so funny and so mischievous and there's so many crazy little things going on. It's nothing like anything that's been done, especially in a contemporary form. You know, it was done in 2014, but listening to the music, you would have no idea. But that's what makes it so genius. It's just so funny, and I can't wait to see, like, how audiences react to each death, because I think it's, like, not the fact that they're getting murdered. I think it's how it happens, and each one gets a little more ridiculous. But each death is unique and told with great storytelling and creative storytelling. Uh, that's very witty and so I think audiences can expect fun and joy from watching the Dyesmith family die every time. It's not no gore, it's not disgusting, it's just hysterical. In addition to being a brazenly silly show that blends light-hearted murderous intrigue with upper-class outlandishness and romantic shenanigans, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder boasts a madcap score that winks at legendary composers while also being totally unconventional. I don't understand I'm not being grand. I don't understand the poor. I don't understand I'm not being grand. I don't understand the poor. What's great about this musical is that in every way it feels classic and old fashioned and yet so contemporary and fresh in every way as well. If I just sing what's on the page, it does almost all of the work for me because of how well it's written, how well the lyrics are put together. It has a lot of that classic sound. It's pulled back right back to that vaudevillian area while also keeping some of the contemporary flair as well. It's often a misconception. People hear Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder and they think, oh gosh, no, that sounds dreary. And no, it's deliciously dreary. Ready for some pure imagination? A dozen dancers from Broadway's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory suited up in delicious duds to pose for an exclusive Broadway.com photo shoot with photographer Matthew Murphy. Watching these performers in action is almost as sweet as winning a golden ticket. So we just finished our Gotta Dance with the whole Charlie cast. Um, this was so fun. We have such an amazing group here. And to be able to come and play like this, in colors like this. You don't always get to dress up in this crazy stuff and, and do all this with, with our cast. We just get to do our show. So this is a really fun thing to do. High fashion, high gloss, candy confectionery. Yes, all the colors, all the colors. colors. And you get to work together. And we get to do it together. And we're besties in the show. And to get to do all of those movements and, and, um, and be creating things together was so cool. It's so fun. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Moving together, falling over each other. A lot of connection. Yeah, a lot of connection. A lot of uh, forced perspective. He did one where KTP was like all the way in back of me and I was closer to the camera. <laughs> Starting off strong. <laughs> 
on the stairs. We were hanging upside down for a little bit, which was really fun, even if we are losing blood to the head. The tireless ensemble members spent the day twirling and jumping in their confection-themed clothing as we snapped away at Chelsea's Skylight Modern. I feel like a giant candy. Yes. <laughs> Which is very appropriate for our show. <laughs> and we're wearing candies. Like a jello mold. Yeah. You know what I mean? Who doesn't want to wear a plastic skirt? Yes. yes. I'm acting we like are I've candy. eaten candy. <laughs> Being in a Matt Murphy shoot is a dream come true. I've always wanted to shoot with him. It's an honor. And to be able to celebrate our show in this way has been awesome. We had so much fun. When we come back, we sit down with Hamilton's Ewan Morton. Go ahead, throw your rocks at me. Baking a pie is easy, if you know how. I only life were as easy as pie. Waitress is a hit, raised the New York Times, with songs by Grammy-nominated artist Sarah Bareilles, an uplifting celebration of love and laughter. Sugar butter flower. There's a new king reigning the roost at Broadway's Hamilton. Tony nominee Ewan Morton is the latest talent to take on the role of King George in the smash hit, right off an acclaimed run in the national tour of Hedvig and the Angry Inch. He recently stopped by the studio to give us a scoop on his regal run and his suddenly famous son. Hey, Ewan. Hi. How's it going? Really good, thank you. I'm so excited. You're, you're in Hamilton. You're back on I, Broadway. I am, yeah. And, and you said, I'm not going back to Broadway until I'm in the biggest hit that's ever existed. <laughs> I wish. If I'd said that, I would, yeah. I just, I can't believe, I was off on tour. I was, I was away for nine months. I wasn't expecting to come back to New York. Doing an amazing job. Doing it, well, thank playing, you. Playing Hedwig. Thank Hedwig, you. Hedwig and the great show. And I, I was actually, I just signed up for a university uh, in New Mexico. I had rented an apartment in New Mexico. Uh, I'd paid the deposit in New Mexico. To go study what? <laughs> to go study history. Uh, really? Yeah. And then the phone call came. I mean, I, did, I had to audition, but the call came to audition, and I hummed and hard and was like, oh, but I really want to go to school. And and then I got the job, and I thought, are you an idiot? You've gone to doing hell, and you're staying in New York. Now I'm buying an apartment in New York and not leaving and doing my thing online. Everything changed. Everything changed. Everything yeah. changed. Yeah. <laughs> That's so crazy. So I didn't realize you were going to give it all up to be a scholar. I was certainly going to take a break. Take a break. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think uh, there's nothing wrong with expanding one's mind uh -huh. beyond the same thing, which yeah. I've done for a long time. Um, and I think just even having the wherewithal to want to do that has actually given me a fresh look on what I do now. Coming mm -hmm. back and being here and being reminded of what New York, New York is as an actor, yeah. doing Hamilton, maybe I shouldn't leave. Okay, so Hamilton. Yes. Good gig. It's a great gig. People, I'm sure people were very excited. I'm sure your friends and family were like, uh, you're in Hamilton. Uh, that, that's amazing. Uh, yes, yeah. they were, of course. I mean, Everyone's yeah. heard of it. You don't have to explain to right. non-theater people exactly. what it is. Exactly. If you say taboo, they'll go, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's, it's the zeitgeist, isn't it? Did it? Is it here because of the zeitgeist, or is the zeitgeist here because of Hamilton, whatever? You know, yeah. But it sort of was the perfect timing, uh -huh. um, the perfect casting, the first thing that, that's that's cast really colorblind. I hate that. Mm -hmm. I hate that. that phrase, but n no one is watching the show thinking, why is Jefferson black? Right. Because yeah. it doesn't matter. I mean, it's proved something outside of just what a musical can be. Yep. It's also proved what genuine, talented casting can be, mm -hmm. um, what good actors can do, right. just irrespective of the color of their skin. Right. So I think just being part of that is really exciting. I mean, the show's great and all that other stuff, yeah. but all the stuff that comes behind it, all the stuff that Hamilton stands for, mm -hmm. Um, I'm really proud to be part of. And you're not playing Hamilton? No, no, I'm not, and thank God. He has a <laughs> lot to do. <laughs> you're <laughs> King George. I am the and king. And it's been a great, amazing lineup of actors who have now taken on this None part. of them are British. I'm the first Brit. So you're able to look down on the Americans with a whole different... <laughs> with, with a real sense of disgust. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it's funny, uh, you sort of stand there every night and, and, and uh, you know, the show finishes and I, and I always leave the theater and I think to myself, <laughs> Well, if only you'd kept Britain, things would be much different today. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sense of <laughs> at the end. It, is it as much fun as it looks like? That yes. you, every time you get on stage, you get to sort of 
I mean, every moment is a moment. Yeah, I walked into a role that gets at entrance applause even if you're a c capuchin monkey. You know, if you <laughs> stuck a monkey in the role and it came out dressed as the king, people would go wild. Um, it, so yes, it's a great feeling, technically speaking, but it's also, it's a challenge in a different way. You have to uh -huh. maintain character mm -hmm. throughout long periods of not being on stage, which I've right. never really done before. And that's yeah. difficult and, and different and something you have to gear your mind and your body toward you're still coming on vocally and emotionally in the same place that you're supposed mm -hmm. to be throughout the three songs. So it's an interesting challenge in ways that I didn't think it would be. Right, but after coming off something like Head of Egg, which was mammoth, then you did a nice long run. Yeah, we did nine months. Yeah. And I was on tour, so you also had the sort of mammoth idea of moving every week and, right. go, you know, and going to North Carolina or, or San Diego or whatever you Did you, you make local references? In every different city, and yeah. And how we, did you keep track of those? Uh, well, they were g we were given a slew of information about each city and we would pare it down, me and John and you know, whoever and you was you would write them all over the stage? Right? No, no, I just memorized them on the bus and That's crazy. to the next location or on the flight. But Hedwig is a different beast entirely. She has so much to say, and it's not just about what she says right. or how she says, it's just the way she speaks to people. The people I would meet after the show, they were there because Hedvig set them free. Mm. And when people see King George, they're there because he's, you know, he's funny and right. he's the British guy. It's, it's a different feeling, yeah. you know. I'm fulfilling a different purpose here. Mm -hmm. And whilst it's awesome and amazing, it, it's, it, it took some getting used to. I first met you 14 years ago. You did, Because I know. that's when you were in rehearsal mm -hmm. for Taboo. That's right. I like to say Taboo, not Taboo. That's I like to do it the British way. Mm -hmm. And I love that show so much. I listen to you sing that role to me all the time. Awesome. You probably don't listen to it. I, I do. I haven't listened to it in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> What's your craziest memory of doing that show? Honestly, for me, the whole experience of just coming to America and not having been here before, coming into a job which was playing the lead mm -hmm. on Broadway, mm -hmm. singing in Times Square. I mean, I remember, I think the third time I ever saw Times Square, I was on a stage at that Broadway. Probably on Broadway. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, with these screens and this yeah. sound and thousands of people. And yeah. I, I was completely mind blown. I, I came with, with sort of no expectations and I, by the time Taboo was over, I realized that I'd found my place. Tony nomination? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Exciting, yeah. Yeah, I just slept with all the right people. It was great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's uh, none of that really mattered. I mean, at the time, it was just so devastating what happened to Taboo. Yeah. Taboo was not a bad show. No, I don't care no, what no. any of those it's people a fantastic said. Show. It was a fantastic show. Do you think it show. should come back? I think if it did come back, they'd have to do it right. But I, I have to be honest with, with the fact that because Taboo didn't go well, mm -hmm. um, I've, this is my fourth time on Broadway in 14 years. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I don't think that speaks to my lack of talent necessarily. Absolutely Although not. I'm a terrible auditioner, right. um, which may have something to do with it. But it's also to do with, you are sometimes marked by your mm. past. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people actually used to say to me, oh, you were so wasted then, you were so high mm -hmm. that night, because people thought I was really taking drugs, yeah. which I wasn't doing, right. <laughs> but that uh, hurt my reputation. So yeah. Taboo for me was an experience of all kinds of things. But the most memorable was the ride and, and the <laughs> pulling back into the station at the end and wondering what I was gonna go on next. But it, it also really long time. You know, goes to show how, how difficult a career can be and building yeah. a career, yeah. which leads me to my, my final question. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, I see this little boy on all the taxi tops. I know. Y young Sheldon, Yeah. Ian Armitage, your son. Has he? He's your son. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, he's your son. He is my uh, son. And Isn't he's he having a big Hollywood moment. He is. And what is that like for you as a dad to watch that? Well, Obviously, everyone fell in love with him from his Ian Left Theater. And Big Little Lies and was his first Lies, big thing. Yes, this was not his TV He hosted, show. A, he presented an Annie no, he's, it's a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, he's huge. And I think it couldn't happen to a nicer child. Uh, and I would say that even if Ian wasn't my son, genuinely, because he is kind. Generous, uh, giving. He isn't selfish. He isn't mean. He's never had a tantrum in his life, and I mean that never, not once. He's never stood in the street and screamed, mm -hmm. ever. Usually tap dancing. Well, anything. actually, I, I tell this story because this is a the, the, a mark of this child. He tap danced in Times Square once. I, I don't know. If he's, I don't know why, but he did, and he was with some homeless man and blah blah. blah and tap danced in Times Square, and he made like five hundred bucks. There you cash. go. <laughs> and he gave it to the homeless man. Aww. When his mom said, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, I don't need any money, do I? I'm going to give it to my friend over here. Uh, it's not, he's not, it's, he doesn't consciously make decisions to be good. He is just naturally good. Right. And I feel like right now, 
having young, famous people be naturally good, I think, could be really good for the rest of us. Right. Um, I say that I'm the first absent father, one of the few absent fathers who's absent because his child is at work. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm never there. Right. Um, so, but he, and he loves me, and he's very supportive of what I do too. Yeah. And it's important to me that he is. That's I, awesome. You know, when I he says it. nice things, I love it too. <laughs> well, we have to let you go, become, yes. the king, become the king. I have to go be the so king. So everyone, uh, go see Hamilton. Yes. I mean, if you can get in. And you, you can get in. There are ways to get, get in. in yeah, people wait. I mean, people love. It's it, worth the wait. I've never seen people love theater as much as they love this. Isn't it this. awesome? Yeah, it's really remarkable. And it changed every other theater. Yeah. It wasn't just for Hamilton. Yeah. In the end, they spread it out. Yeah. And it's been, it's changed the great white way. You deserve it. Oh, I'm oh so thanks. happy for you. Thank you. So everyone, <laughs> you. Uh, check out this guy. Mm, check me out. You and Morton at, in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you. Coming up, we go to church with the Color Purple Tour Stars. Go ahead, throw your rocks at me. Baking a pie is easy, if you know how. I'm still standing. If only life were as easy as pie. Waitress is a hit, raves the New York Times, with songs by Grammy-nominated artist Sarah Bareilles, an uplifting celebration of love and laughter. Hi, I'm Sherry Renee Scott, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Thank you for watching the Broadway.com show. We leave you with the stars of the national tour of the Color Purple gorgeously singing the title song. See you next week.